You're listening to Sacks in the Basement, a production of the Broadcast Basement Limited, where every show is 30 minutes of good and comes from a basement bar on the south side of Chicago. Pull up a stool, pour a cold one, and join us right now for Sacks in the Basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always at SacksInTheBasement.com. I want to have a fun just before the White Sox really get into it and start the season, half hour here on Sox in the Basement. Well, actual fun, like not negativity, not not mad about something. I'm not, not negative. Not screaming about Rick Hahn or Larry Garcia well, or Yon Mankato. I'm, I'm or not negative. You think I'm negative? On occasion, you've Matt been Zawaski. known to be slightly less than positive. Matt Zawaski sitting down yes. here at the Nine Foot Homemade Oak Bar from Pinwheels and Ivy, known as Father Zoe. What other names? You got like fifteen names, right? Father Zoe, uh, just Zoe. Uh, the artist formerly known as Matt. <laughs> no, I just. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just yeah, yeah. His name is a symbol. He's yes. with he's with Sports Mockery, yes. right? Yep. And, and 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 he also so. Sports Mockery is one of his babies, and then he's also got Pinwheels and Ivy, where they talk Sox and Cubs, and uh, we've met Matt several times, and I told Zoe that I wanted him to come down to the bar for a while, and so he is going to join us, and for for this episode, we're going to have three people. So it's a, and, and do you think I'm negative? Am I a negative person? You listen to me. Yeah. Um, I'd put you in the middle. In the middle? I'd put you in the middle. Okay, because I, I think I'm positive from time to time. I'm excited about certain things. I like the idea of Yoan Moncada being in the WBC. I was like that. He's going to find a stroke. He's going to be with his countrymen. He's not going to have, you know, any pressure on him. He's too much in his head. I was all for it. And of course, He's going to get himself into a collision so he has an excuse <laughs> for the rest of the White Sox season. <laughs> I mean, like, maybe I'm the negative one. What was, hang what on was your reaction? What was your reaction, though, on that one? Because as soon as I saw the injury, I was like, well, that's probably the excuse now at the end of the year. Well, he would have had a great year, but he bruised those ribs back in March. And right. he played, fought through them like a warrior. Yeah, he's a he's a really big triumph story. He overcomes so many obstacles. <laughs> uh, I don't, I, they were getting absolutely boat raced by Team USA at that point. I mean, he made an awkward attempt at a fly ball that was a tweener between him and the left fielder. He got hit, and he didn't even like make an attempt to get it. He just stayed there. He just laid there, and he told his left fielder to wait for the trainer. Part of me thinks it was the old little league, like, oh, my arm hurts. I can't play in this game anymore type thing. I think it'll be fine. To your point, though, earlier, I think – it worked though. I think he did find us. He was the oh, best yeah. hitter on that Cuban team. Yeah, I mean, people are making fun of the fact that, like, well, look at the competition he went up against. Well, not everybody went out and hit 400. No. Not everybody went and lit it up. He was leading his team. Look, Luis Robert didn't do what he did. I mean, right there on the same team facing the same pitchers, Yoan Moncada outshined Luis Robert. He keeps putting the ball on the ground. Yes. I, I said that was a concern before he started. That was one of the reasons why I didn't want him there because he needs to start working with the White Sox about the fact that his launch angle averaged 10 degrees last year. And I was like, well, maybe that's because he was swinging with one arm and he was dealing with all kinds of injuries. But whatever happened, he's in a funk and they got to get him back into camp and get him going. Yeah, it would have been nice if he could have gotten some kind of U.S. residency before this WBC because I would have loved to him to be coached up by Ken Griffey Jr., uh, that was one of the things I loved about T.A. being on Team USA is he gets to be coached by Ken Griffey Jr. And how does that hurt you at all? So How is Griff not at camp all the time? Isn't he a White Sox legend? Yeah, he should be. <laughs> <laughs> this episode of Sox in the Basement is brought to you proudly by Cork and Carey at the park in the shadow of the ballpark at 33rd and Princeton. Award-winning menu of burgers and ballpark favorites. Two for one, actually, when it's not a Sox home game on Monday. So get in there, dine in, and have two for one burgers. An extensive bar, rotation of craft beers, familiar favorites, spirits. I bring the kids in there before the game. I get them a burger. I make it part of the ballpark experience. They got all kinds of ballpark food. At the end of the game, I'm generally over there with my sister because she gets loud and, and a little obnoxious at White Sox games. She gets really fired up after a win and she needs to come down a little bit before she goes back to the family. And so I, I get her out there with other White Sox fans for the celebration in front of the cork. See more and see us at the home of the podcast for fans by fans. Cork and carry at the park. Uh, CorkandCarry.com. How often do you get out there to the cork? I've seen you out there before. Yeah, I try to. It's a great spot, especially once you get kind of more involved in the the White Sox Twitter community. 
it's uh, where everyone tends to, as you just mentioned, meet up before the game. When the weather finally gets nice, I know it feels like that's never going to happen, but when the weather does finally get nice, it's a great place to meet up with people before the games. You're outside, you know, you have a good time. And then after the games, if you get lost from that group, you go there and it's like a, what do they call it? In the a military? rallying point. A rally point. There yeah. you go. Yeah. It's, it is a rally point. It's a rally point. point. Yeah, that's where the revolution will be had at Corbin yes. Carey. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so you you're you're over at Sports Mockery. Yes. You you you're running the pinwheels and Ivy Pod. I would I would say you're the captain of that ship. There are several guys that get on that. It's interesting because you're talking Sox and Cubs. Yes. And you know we're just a Sox podcast. And I thought today about the fact you you were coming on, and I, and I thought to myself, is it really as big of a hatred type rivalry? as it was maybe 20 years ago, before the Sox won the World Series in 05, before the Cubs got it in 16. Because I'll tell you this, once the White Sox won in 05, I didn't care as much anymore. I wasn't angry. I was like, I was like, we got ours. I would tell them that all the time. When they finally got theirs, I was like, good for you. I'm happy for you, which ticked them off even more. Like, I've never really had a, a, like a fresh hatred like I did before that. But what's it like on your show? So I've always been of the train of thought that the teams I hate, are the teams that can directly affect the White Sox postseason fate. So that is, well, up until the schedule this year, that's the Twins, the Tigers, the Royals, anyone in the AL Central. Those are the teams you see more than anybody else. I've never considered the Cubs rival. Just because we share the same city, we play them, what, six times a year? Right. I mean, do you consider the Angels a rival? Like, you know, I've never really been big on that. That's why I was very open to this idea. Uh, there's definitely a lot of people with the train of thought, you know, South side versus North side. That's fine. If that's your bag, go for it. Um, but I also feel like as information has become more available, like now you got fantasy baseball, baseball, video games, Twitter stats, everything. People don't really tend to get too deep into that rivalry as much as they used to, because, you know, you look at your fantasy baseball team and you have Nico Horner on it and it's your star second baseman. So you're kind of rooting for Nico to do well or whatever. We've definitely seen, especially in our comment section during the live show, it's it's pretty civil for the most part. You don't see it as bad as it used to be. I feel like most of the people who come in are like, North side all the way are really actually from Ohio. Yes, anyway. that too. <laughs> that too, 100%. And the South Siders are from Joliet. Right. <laughs> or Kenosha. But, uh, but, here, but here's the thing. like Like, you're right about how, well, first of all, when I was a kid back in the 80s, back into the seventies in the eighties and they, it was an exhibition game. Yes. So you only really saw them face each other once. And you saw the best of their minor leagues. Maybe. Right. Cause it didn't really matter. Yeah. That's why Jordan got so much play. I was in just going to say that. Yeah, right. I was just right. going to say that. But he was never coming up from anywhere, anywhere close to the city from Birmingham. But you were a kid, and I think as a kid, it's fun to argue with the other kids in the classroom. Absolutely. You know, in St. Dennis, I was over there at 83rd in St. Louis arguing. Like, you know, and there was a kid who would show up in a Cubs jacket and everybody would be like, well, get out of here. What are you even doing in our neighborhood? Like, I mean, like, that's what it was. But that was me with a White Sox jacket on the north side of Chicago, right. the northwest suburbs. Yep. So, yeah, you know. But now you're right. I mean, I'm, I don't know. I, I'm going to say his name wrong because I don't follow the Cubs very closely. But this uh, Wesneski kid. Wiz- and Wesneski. Is that how you say it? Uh, we like to call him Wiznasty. Okay. Because <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's yeah, a good name he's going to be pretty good. Yeah, um, he was picked up late in our fantasy baseball draft and I, I could feel Ed groan. Oh, I was the so internet. mad. Because so, <laughs> I put him on my team and he groaned. Right, right before I had a chance to pick him. Texting Chris. You so, yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't besmirch putting Cub players on no, my fantasy team. I'm not like that. I, I actually besmirch putting White Sox players on the team because I'm bad luck for them. He ruins them, man. It do, it actually, yeah, anybody want me to ruin this year, by the way? No. No. Don't not ruin on the White anybody. Sox. Okay. No. Just but make sure there's nobody you, you want off the team. No. I mean, well, I mean, do you have a White Sox player on your team right now? No, I don't. Okay, good. Keep, Keep it that it way. That way. <laughs> I, that's my plan. Dylan Cease just... got better the moment you traded him. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing with the fantasy with the White Sox players, I always thought it as, why am I going to make myself double mad? <laughs> that's a good I, I, I'm mad that he's not performing <laughs> really for the point. White Sox, and then I'm mad that he's not performing for my... Now I am double mad. I'm the same way with the Bears in fantasy football. I just... I don't do it. You don't want to deal with it. I don't want to deal with it. I like that. I like that. If you look at this team right now, this White Sox team, and I, th- I'm i not doing this because I'm trying to be negative. I'm doing it because of what we're talking about right now. If mm-hmm. you look at this White Sox team right now, is there a player 
and who might actually look like they're doing really well, that you're most afraid will totally bust out, like should be on one of those fantasy baseball or real life baseball bust list for the White Sox, where you're like, I want the best for them. I'm expecting the worst. I'd be super over the moon excited if I got something good out of this player, but I'm not sure if I believe it. Well, I think we we mentioned two of the ones that come to mind that play for Team Cuba. Oh, my goodness. I, I, See, and that's scaring yeah. me because Robert's uh, so important to this yeah, White Sox team. Yeah. Yeah. And I saw someone yesterday, and it was one of those things where you see a tweet and you shake your head because you're like, I hate that, but it's right. And it was a picture of Luis Roberts standing next to uh, the Mariners kid that plays center field. Um, oh, Kalenic? Oh, no, 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 not him. The, Julio Rodriguez? Yes. Yeah. Julio, it was Julio Rodriguez and Luis Robert Jr. standing arm in arm. And the tweet said, uh, McDonald's versus McDonald's at home. Oh my and I was gosh. just like, no. And it, it was just like, oh, man, that, Ow. that, dog, that hurt really bad because it's kind of it's true right now. And uh, I, I get nervous about Luis Robert. I know he has the physical abilities. It's, the talent is there. It's more the mechanics. And I think once he gets back with this new hitting regime, It'll be okay, and then Yoan Moncada. See, I think Yoan Moncada's already there, though. I, I, I think he's, I think he's had that moment of breaking out, and then everybody looking at him, going, "What, what happened?" Yes. Well, I'm going to tell you this. I also don't want to hear anything about his ribs. No, from no. the White Sox. No, 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 you, no. You, you keep telling me you want to earn the trust back of the fans. Don't put him on the field till he's 100 percent healed. It's spring training. If he needs three days to be 100, percent make him 100 percent. Because I he don't want three hear, weeks. Give him three weeks. I don't want to hear about the ribs. I don't. I don't want to hear him as an excuse. I don't want to hear anything about what happened to him in Cuba. In fact, to be honest with you, I'm starting to become one of these guys. Like, I've resisted this so much. The idea that the team doesn't know how to play through injuries, because I think that that's just like a weak thing that people come up with. They're like, oh, they're soft, right? But if I get another year like like last year, where everybody's got a hangnail, or they're pulling up lame like, like, uh, like Aloy, this week, running down the first base with leg cramps, eat a banana and have some water for crying out loud. You're a professional athlete. Like, like if I see this again this year, it's going to be hard for me to resist saying they're soft. Moncada's definitely, he's had the soft label now for two, three years and he's kind of earned it. Well, when you listen, you come to the South side of Chicago and you've got your own music video, you better hit 300 right. or somebody's going to and give you a hard a time. Jump, and you're wearing a floral jumper right. on the said video. Yes. Um, and I can see your chains from the 500 level. Yeah. You better hit. Yeah. yeah. I think or, he, or you better be, if if you are saying you're playing through injury, there better be a limb hanging off by a threat. <laughs> well, to that point. I mean, I better be able to see sinew on your elbow before, before I'm sitting there going, yeah, okay, he's playing hurt. 100%. To that point, I think Luis Robert Jr. actually went up a notch in a lot of Southsiders book. When he's out there swinging with one hand, he yeah. had no business being out there, but he played. Yeah. And I think people, you know, from the neighborhood and everybody, you know, we're all blue collar. People were like, yeah, that dude's earning his check. Yeah. You that's know? how like, I felt. Yeah. And yeah, so, I did. I definitely did. Uh, if your baseball player has sore ribs or let's say mom and dad are trying to stay out of assisted living, uh, you've recently <laughs> had a, a surgery. Right there. Listen, high at home medical equipment takes care of all of it. That's right. true. That's yeah. true. They, they can are, handle the whole spectrum. They are located here on the south side, and the idea is to keep everybody who needs to go and get themselves healed up in the home and, and not at some other location. All right? Mom and dad worked really hard, and they don't want to leave their home now. Instead, set them up with devices that will open and close doors with the touch of a button, uh, lifts that will get them from one floor to another floor, uh, aids set up throughout the house to stop them from falling down and to protect them, and to make just life a little bit easier. They're going to work with your insurance. And if you mention socks in the basement, you get additional money off. Reach out to them. Look at uh, HHME.com. See everything they have to offer. But most importantly, stop into the showroom because they will talk to you about everything they have to offer, including the latest in CPAP technology and diabetes control. 3518 West 95th Street in Evergreen Park. Let's get positive now. Okay. okay. I who's like your, this. Who's your breakout? So who's the guy? That you're sitting there and you can't wait, even though there is no rivalry and you said all the right things about like, you know, Cub fans and like, but you want to sit there and say, we got this guy and look at him tear it up this year when you're sitting on pinwheels and Ivy. Well, the obvious answer, especially when you angle the question like that is Aloy. Yeah. We literally got him from them. Yeah. Um, injuries aside, cause he's a big dumb animal, that guy, you know, <laughs> 
<laughs> well, the, the whole diving into the net and all yeah, that other goofy yeah, stuff. I know. But if you look at him, he literally looks like half the guy size wise that he was last year. He got toned. You know, everybody that's ever lifted a weight knows there's lifting for strength and lifting for show. You could tell he lifted for strength and he's gotten tight. And it, I think he can easily be not only an all-star, but like a breakout candidate this year. But obviously the caveat is don't get cramps and get helped off by a trainer. Don't dive into nets. Don't play the field. Be the DH that you should be. Is it interesting to you guys that he goes off and he's with another team? And while he's under the watchful eye of somebody who's not the White Sox, who saw these problems with their team last year, with a manager who's trying to make sure this doesn't happen again, with an organization that's so focused on the idea of we can't go through this again with these little injuries and guys not in condition, that he gets back from the WBC and immediately isn't ready to run the first base. Was that telling you? That tells me something a little bit about Aloy in his preparation to be game ready. Now, lifting weights and getting, you know, getting tight, getting swole, getting whatever. I don't know these terms because I'm old and fat. <laughs> you rattle them off pretty I, easily. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I like to pretend in my sleep that I'm actually much better looking than I really am. Um, but, you know, lifting and getting yourself in the best shape of your life. You and I have joked about how many guys are in the best shape of their life in spring training. And doing that is fine. But. I sometimes question with these guys whether or not they're in game shape, right? Are you able to make a sprint from the batter's box to first base? Are you able to run the bases? Are you able to have that kind of quick twitch movement that, that happens? Because running laps, let's face it, you're going to run, you're going to do your cardio in the off season. You're going to lift in the off season. It's a little different than reacting to a line drive, right? It's a little different than, than, you know, it, it's like last year with, Andrew Vaughn in the outfield, he goes and dives for a ball and immediately hurts himself. And you're looking at him like, what are you doing? First of all, you didn't need to dive for that. Well, okay, one, he's not used to reading balls in the outfield. Two, he just he does not have that kind of development. And when I see these guys go down to first base and pull up with a hammy or pull up with a cramp or something like that, the first thought I have in my mind is, did you run any damn sprints in the offseason? Did you get yourself in game shape? And I don't think Aloy was in game shape. And that's kind of, I think, more of the worry with the WBC and guys getting hurt is when you show up to spring training – you might be in the best shape of your life in terms of like taking your shirt off and flexing, but are you in game shape? Are you in game condition to do the things that you need to do within the game and make those movements? And I look at Aloy and sometimes I wonder, and I've wondered this about his career. Do you keep yourself in game shape or are you the type of guy that just, you know, you lift for the strength you lift for, you know, to make yourself look good in the uniform, uh, you know, keep the shirt unbuttoned a little bit because of, you know, the whole swollness and tightness and things like that. You know, this is an interesting question here for our guest, because uh, if you you can't see Matt Sawaski from Pinwheels and Ivy, but Zoe is an athletic guy. He walks in. Well, he was upset. <laughs> he was telling me about how he's trying to get himself a little bit more in the shape. You know, he, I'm talking about how I got to lose weight. This guy's telling me before he starts sitting here at the nine foot homemade oak bar about how he's down a little bit in terms of how much he benches. So like we have very different priorities. Like me, I'm like, I'm fat. I need to fit in his shirt. And he's like, I got to get a little bit uh, more in shape. And he's talking about because I, I could tell. And I hurt myself buckling myself into my seatbelt <laughs> the other day. But I could tell he's an True athlete. Story. Like before 16 inch softball starts every year where I'm going to go out and I'm just going to try not to kill myself as a 45 year old and play in this church league on the south side. I will go out in the backyard and I will start practicing quick sprints so I don't blow out an Achilles when I'm coming out of the box because I know I have to get ready because I've done that before and partially torn it. You keep yourself in shape. What do you think about that theory? No, I, I definitely agree. And, and, you know, that was one of the things that I really liked about the whole WBC because I thought it might speed up some of these guys getting real game ready because these games mean something to them, you know, and you get nervous with the spring training that some of these injuries are stupid because these guys are going through the motions. Like, Oh, I got to be here. I don't care. Like, this is just whatever. But I thought the WBC would be like, this is for my country. These games matter. You're seeing it with these emotions. So that's why I was very surprised to see Aloy pull up. And obviously your first reaction when he walks off with the trainer is, you know, his here legs, we go again. Yeah, his legs are broken. He's going to be in a wheelchair. It's going to be the worst case scenario. And then they're like, He's got cramps, and like you said, eat a banana, drink some cranberry juice. I don't do something. But <laughs> okay, here's the question though: Aloy from a wheelchair or Larry? Is a wheelchair legal? Probably not, but I mean, still, 
Listen, you can't put the wheelchair everywhere, though. You could put Leori everywhere, which is still one of the dumbest arguments I've ever heard by a time. He might life. not make the four. He might not be. I don't know. I don't, you know, it's a, look, we've here's what's funny. On this show now, we've had several different people that covered a team very closely, right? Mm -hmm. Like James Fox, you can tell over a future sax. He's got a source. You, oh, yeah. he, he's broken a few stories, and he's got a pretty good idea of what they're thinking inside that place, right? Yep. And then you've got Scott Merkin who comes on, and he's been with the team for decades following them. And then we get James Fegan on. And what's funny is, over the last three weeks, with those three guys appearing on this show at some point, I've heard the varying opinions of Fegan saying, Alberto is the guy that Griffo wants, but Griffo isn't going to get what he wants necessarily because it's $11 million still on the books and it's going to be an organizational thing. I get Merck sitting there telling me, you know what? Look at them. They've gotten rid of other guys that have money on them. Who knows what they're going to do? It's a complete possibility. And then I got Fox sitting there telling me he doesn't believe it in any way. Right. He, cause he's, I think in his mind, he's like, I just don't trust these guys. He's a little bit more of a fan as well. Right. Even he's got his say, that's, that's the fan. But part I've heard of like this, this spectrum of people who covered a team and nobody seems to be able to figure out what's going to happen here with that last couple of spots on the bench. Is that weird to you? Because I going into camp, I felt like it was almost decided. We even did a show. We did a show where we where basically like, said uh, there's one spot open. Right. And now it feels like it's really up for grabs on that bench. Who do you think makes this bench? So this is actually been a topic of discussion on pinwheels and ivy now for three weeks running because it changes for us week to week right yeah. where i mean the obvious ones is you obviously have sebi zavala that's the given yeah, he's, he's he's there he's he's basically your co-starting catcher for right the and then that's where it starts because you you got to imagine sheets is going to make sheets this. is going to make it because Fegan, so. Fegan told me us on the show last time Sheets has got a spot on this team. Yes. They keep talking about how they want to get him a bunch of at bats. Not only is he going to have a spot, he's going to play regularly. Right. Okay. Which I think that I think that when he's playing, it's going to be one of those things where Colas isn't going to go up against a tough lefty or, or whatever, whatever they're going to end up doing, however they're going to do this. But there's going to be a time where you may see Jimenez move out in the right or some some one of the outfielders is sitting down. And when Jimenez moves out into the outfield, you'll see Sheets as the DH when the situation calls for it. Yes. Yeah. So I think he's on there too. I think those are the two I'm sure about. And then, yeah, so those are the slam dunks. And then the other two, that's where it gets interesting because Alberto, I mean, he had a three-run homer today. Before, I know, and yeah, the manager and loves him. He is absolutely raking. He is the doing, manager wants yeah. Alberto and Billy Hamilton, I think. Yes. I think well, that's what he wants. He wants I, the speed. Based on, play, based on play, I think that's what I'm seeing because I thought, I thought Hazley had a chance at the start because he was hitting well. He could play all three outfield positions, but I think he's kind of fallen off. I think that he wants Hamilton for the speed. And also, Hazley was stealing bases. This is a great conversation if you if you sit down at Hailstorm Brewing. You see how I do that? Do you that's guys really transition good. into ads? I, I do. I try. Not yeah. as That's not as smooth as you, though. <laughs> I don't know if that was smooth because I kind of called attention to it. Yeah. Uh, I, I, <laughs> they are the official brewery of Socks the in the Velvet Basement. Fog over here. Located out in Tinley Park at 8060, 186th Street, right off of 80th Avenue. They're starting to do lunch now, and that's a scratch kitchen that they brought in there. So they've really upgraded it. So now it's not only a working brewery where you can see them putting out all the different beers. And trust me, if you're there when the brewer's walking around, who knows what you're going to get to try that isn't on the menu. Right. Okay. They're, they they love making beer. So it's a beer guy, beer gal's place to it's be It's a beer at. hall. Okay. Let's face it, that is a beer hall yeah. if there ever was one. It's got the it's got the 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 tap room where you can come in, you can see everything up on the menu, all the amazing beers, all the styles. It's ever-changing. Plus they've got, you know, gold medal winning beers that they have. And I just tasted one when I was out there last weekend where they're they're using hot peppers in beer now and it wasn't overpowering normally I take a shot of a hot pepper beer and I go okay that's all I want yeah that's I all want, you can do I, I'm not doing a full beer of that but I could taste the pepper and there wasn't like a massive heat and I was like I could drink a pint of this and actually enjoy the flavor of it it's really cool if you're in the pepper beers go out and try that one and then they've got the kitchen and they've got the hall and they don't have any TVs except for when it's like a big event because they'd rather put music up on stage have have people come in playing live on the weekends and they want you to sit down at those big like German beer hall tables and meet people and talk about Hans or Alberto. <laughs> exactly. That's what they want. OK, get in there. They have a lunch special right now where if you do the math very quickly in your head, I believe that you're essentially getting the meal and a beer for the price of the meal. Uh, so that's totally worth it. Check out the menu. Check out the beers all at hailstormbrewing.com. Uh, last brewery you went into. Do you do, you do those? I drink Bush Light. <laughs> 
So the answer to that question is probably not. <laughs> okay. All right. I, like, I, do you need another one? I no. can stop for a second and get I'm, you one. I'm good. I'm He's good. sitting at the bar and he got through the beer that he had in front no, of him. And I, I'm a bad host. I will say with Hailstorm, the one thing I do know about Hailstorm Brewery is back when the Blackhawks were making their run, they came out with the Taves beer. Yeah. And yeah. I remember me and my brother went to a couple different places trying to find it. We finally found it. It was like our holy grail for that that evening like we were so proud that we found it was really good and that's when i hear hailstorm i always associate it to that 19 taves beer i can picture the bottle in my head you know we're talking about that we're talking about the idea that people get together and they like to talk about the team and stuff like that you are far more active on social media than i am and you you and you guys both make make me look like i am some like 89 year old person who can't turn his phone on (laughs) by comparison and and what 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 zoe does with his account on Twitter, and I don't know if you do it on the other things, you do the thing where you you put your faces on other people. Yeah. And I think it's the funniest thing in the world. And I don't know if that means I'm a simpleton or if I'm just right <laughs> no, it's there just in funny. your audience. No, like it's I just think funny. It, I think it's hysterical. It's funny. And I absolutely love it. And if I didn't know you and didn't like you, I'd totally steal it and do it myself. <laughs> but I mean I just I just love watching it. And my my goal in life is at some point is that when you do one that I just appear. Oh, like just my you. big, fat, ugly face oh, appears I mean, for a second. In it. Consider it favorite, done. Somebody, okay. somebody did that with Chris <laughs> and Brett the Hitman Hart. It's still one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my life. So, but but you're you're involved in this thing, and you tweet back at people like me. I get I get somebody who's mad at me. I get somebody who wants to engage. A lot of times I'm not even paying attention. I feel bad. It's been sitting there for three days and I read the comment. I go, "Uh uh-oh, I really need to pay more attention. You get into it. So what is your take on the mood of the fan base? Because I'll read this for you real quick. We got a message through SocksInTheBasement.com and it's a long one, so I'm not going to read the whole thing. But Charlie wrote me a message and I'm just going to read a few things that he wrote in here and then get your reaction to it and your thought on the fan base. He was talking about how His huge disappointment from last year's squad was because with all the talent finally up after rebuild, they were frequently injured, underperformed, and finished at 500. All that time and grief and hope and money went right down the drain. There is the realization that we wasted Jose Abreu. When all the talent finally made it up, with him as the anchor, they failed to produce as expected, and now he's gone. How sickening will it be when he slugs them out in our park as an Astro, you know that's going to happen. I, I feel with all the hope that I have, and I think this team is the AL Central champion. I think they're going to win this division. And I think they're going to get into the locker room and they're going to say unkind things about the Guardians too, and it's going to be amazing. We're going to laugh our butts off about it. But I also get this feeling for the first time in five years of doing this podcast that fans have not come and swung back as quickly as they normally do after a disappointing offseason, there's an anger still there. I saw new tickets released by the White Sox today, which means they don't even have it sold out at opening day yet, and that's telling to me. What is your take on the fan vibe? The fan vibe, in my opinion, is basically right now the White Sox are the guy that dumped us, and they're trying to get us back. And we're very hesitant about it. We're thinking about it because, you know, he's cute. Yeah. But we're we're thinking about it, and but he's going to have to earn the trust back. I think history will not be kind to the La Russa hire. I think everything that, that Charlie just said in that right up there is accurate, and it will come back to the La Russa Except hire. Except for the word rebuild. Yeah, well, retool or, yeah, or whatever <laughs> you want to call it. But I will die on that hill. Um, <laughs> I think the people are – Generally optimistic, but very hesitant. They just don't want to get hurt again. And I think it shows in the ticket sales. It shows in the fan-funded billboards that say sell the team. Like there's, there's anger there because they, they wasted a lot of a year of, a year of control on Luis Robert Jr. and all these other guys. Jose Abreu, people are angry, but it's still the White Sox. So, well, don't yeah. you also think, too, that this is, this is a product of being told we're going to do it this way, the rebuild way? And, and I, as much as I'm dead on that hill already of it's not a rebuild, the idea that we were going to suffer for something better as opposed to the Kenny Williams era of we're just going to keep going after it every year. I'm going to try and grab the best free agent I can. I'm going to try and make a trade. I'm going to try and give Mike Soratka to a team that doesn't realize his shoulder's completely blown out, you know, um, lie, uh, you know, things like that. I mean, it, we, we were kind of for years, it was like, all right, 
we sign this guy and we sign this guy and we make this trade. Hey, we got a chance. We got a chance. We got a chance. But then we went through like three or four years of, well, we know we're going to suck, but Johan Moncada, we got him in the trade. And Michael Kopech, we got him in the trade. And check out all these Cuban guys we're getting. This is great. Yeah. And now we sit there and we watch Tony La Russa literally sleepwalk his way through the 2022 season. I mean, I, I can understand my fans are a little annoyed by that because we, for the first time in, in, in modern White Sox history, intentionally suffered as opposed to suffering because Jerry didn't want to spend money. I, I have a comparison, though, to this for, oh, the, for the younger kids, for the older White Sox fans. And I'm sure the fans that are older than me have years that they can sit there and say, no, no, no. I've gone through this before as we sit here with Matt Sawaski, uh, otherwise known as Father Zoe, and all the other nicknames he has from Pinwheels and Ivy. And he and every guest of Sox in the Basement brought to you proudly by the Village of Lamont want to experience a downtown with real history, great eats and drinks, and green spaces filled with adventure. Visit the Village of Lamont, shop, dine, drink, explore, and uh, check out the new Pollyanna Social down there. Uh, I actually went there and had a bourbon and talked about it on Southside Pod. So you can listen to the review and go check it out and visit LamontDowntown.com. What what I compare this to, this anger, is similar to the day that I got back to Chicago in my radio career. I've never, I don't think, ever told this story. We're coming up on 500 episodes this year, and I, I never have told this story before. I've been living all over the country the White Sox have fallen apart late in 2003. Jerry Manuel has been caught sleeping in the dugout. You have watched the Sox in the 90s. This is a fan base that watched the Sox in the 90s, waste all the talent in the early 90s, watched the owner spearhead the ownership side that led to the to the lockout or strike. I can't remember what it was. And it took away a season when they should have won the World Series. Right. And then you watch the debacle of the late 90s. And now you're the in the early 2000s train. and people are miserable and hate the team. And I'm driving back with a moving truck with all of my stuff. I've just left Southern California. I'm moving back home. I decided I'm done with radio for a while. I hate the industry. I turned down a contract. He's I'm on my way back home. in a Hallmark I'm, movie. Yeah, I'm moving <laughs> along. Okay, I'm in the car and I'm looking for Chicago radio because I miss my hometown. I haven't listened to Chicago radio in years. In years, really, I haven't listened to Chicago Sports Talk radio because if I came in and visit, it was on the weekends. And I'm flipping along and I hit a Chicago Sports Talk station. And the first thing is a caller who comes on and says, right away, if Jerry Manuel was on fire, I wouldn't piss on him. It was the first thing I ever heard driving into town. And I was like, I'm back, Chicago. And like, I was like in the car laughing hysterically. At See, it. now for those of us who are still here in the city, though, I heard that and I thought, what a refreshing change from people who want to just <laughs> piss on Terry Bevington. <laughs> But if you wanted to pee on him irrationally, that was the moment. And I was like, I'm back. Only this fan base. I, I've been in Southern California. I've been up in Reno, Nevada. I've been out on the East Coast. I've been everywhere. Nobody gets as angry as White Sox fans. And we were angry then. And only bringing back a former shortstop who said he was going to do the little things and do small ball and pay attention to little things, much like this guy. OK, and then all of a sudden winning a World Series. Everybody wanted Jerry Reinsdorf's head on a pike until the day they won the World Series, and then everybody said, oh, okay, I love them now, because we won a World Series, and Paul Canerico gave him the ball. That's probably the only thing that really saves his legacy at this point, is now you need to go and do it again, because people are back to hating him just as much as they used to, right, So, Oh, without a doubt, and, you know, there's... I'm 39 now, and th my age group, we grew up watching the, the Bulls championship, but we all know... He lucked into Michael Jordan. He backed into Michael Jordan right. and the Bulls team. So those don't count. So really, he's been in this position of Chicago ownership for decades, and he has really one World Series that he can call his own. One championship that he, and that's the White Sox one. So he's already walking that thin line, and then just year after year of, hey, check out, I got Ken Griffey Jr. You got 40-year-old Ken Griffey Jr. out there, man. Like... <laughs> Come on, bud. If he and, doesn't make that play, no. in, if he doesn't make that play, throwing out Kadir at home plate, no wait. Yeah, I still love one, that play. You would, you would, <laughs> you would actually, you would have bad memories of Ken. Well, Griffey anybody Jr. else, anybody else, when they read the story that Team USA in the World Baseball Classic is watching Griffey hit bombs out yep. during batting practice, anybody else sit there and go, "Where on earth were the bombs when he was actually <laughs> playing in regular season no, games no, no. for the White Sox?" No, no, right now, Kenny's like, "You think we could sign him again?" Oh, I yeah. know. Oh yeah. Socks in the basement. Socks 
in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found. And always on SocksInTheBasement.com.